1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll be in verses 13 through 16. Kind of an odd number, but we'll take the next two weeks and just kind of expound upon this idea of being holy. And, and now finally seeing some instruction for us as believers and what to do now that we see such a great salvation that God has purchased for us. Have you ever heard the phrase, and I know you have, whether it was from this pulpit or somewhere else, or maybe some worldly person kind of threw it at you, kind of condemning you because you're a Christian and a believer and you want to live for Christ. And so they look at you in a very, very negative way in the sense that you think that you're better than them. And so oftentimes we'll hear this phrase, you're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. You ever hear that phrase? I've heard it from pulpits. No one's ever accused me of being uh, heavenly minded. That would be a, a great accusation. You know, on our part, to be heavenly minded. I've been accused of being self-righteous. I've been accused of being, you know, Jesus freak or extreme, you know, or legalistic in a sense. And I'm like, wow, I'm far from legalistic. But an interesting phrase, you're so heavenly minded, your head's way up there in, in heaven, that down here you're no good. That's a good accusation when you think about it. Because in order to be earthly good, I think that you do have to be heavenly minded. What is the person saying there? What he's saying is, is that I don't like the way that you push your moral values on me. You think that you're good. You think that you're high and mighty. You think you know everything, that you're not really helpful to me here on this earth. And that's really what they're saying. Because they're not saying this. They're not saying, look, uh, you build hospitals and, and you build refugees and, and, and refugees, refuge uh, places and you give to the poor and you do all these wonderful things. And so you're no earthly good. No, that you know, you are earthly good when you do that. Show me an atheist who has built a hospital. We don't have them. They're only built by uh, religious groups or people that really have a care for others. And so when we take our minds and we put them up here in the heavenly realm, then we become earthly good. It's when we're earthly minded that we become no earthly good because we're only focused on ourselves. The theme today in this message is the holy walk of a believer. Now, before you go, what? Wait a minute. Are we supposed to be holy? And what do you mean by holy? Well, we're going to define that word holy because it's not what you think it means. But we as believers are to have a holy walk with the Lord among one another. So what does that mean? And we'll see that today. We left off last week in verses 10 through through 12. This salvation, verse 10, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. We we exhausted that, how how these prophets of the Old Testament had prophesied of this great salvation through Christ Jesus, through his death and resurrection on the cross. And then how it brought grace and faith to believers in the future. Yet they prophesied about it, but they did not understand it. To then it was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Psalms 22, a cross, a crucifixion. I don't know what you're talking about. Roman Empire and, and, and men who put people on crosses, foreign to them because it never existed. And so though they searched the scriptures to understand these things, they did not comprehend it completely. And then in verse 12, it ends with with uh, things which angels desire to look into. So also we saw that angels desire to look into our salvation. And we came to the conclusion that the reason was it was God was showing them the truth of submission, that man having free will will choose God rather than this world, because a third of the angels who also had free will had chose to rebel against God. And so God, in a sense, is showing the angels, in a sense, under a microscope, us believers and how we relate ourselves to the gift of salvation. And that is pretty amazing because we are we are being watched and the things that we do are being watched by angels. Of course, obviously, by God, too, and his perfect will. So we have a great responsibility there. So because of this, 
How should we respond to such a great salvation? Here comes the instruction by Peter for us believers. Obviously, to the early church that was going through persecution and suffering, Peter himself had been put in jail several times, so he understands suffering. He understands persecution. A lot of the believers were, were being killed, were being beheaded by the Roman government, being, being um, mocked by Judaism. The religious system of that time, many of the Gentiles are being killed. So there's a lot of suffering going on. But Peter is really encouraging them concerning their salvation. That there's still a coming hope. uh, Our salvation of our souls in the future. Now, we can't really relate to this because we're not suffering like they were suffering. You know, we don't get mocked as much as they get. They were mocked or ridiculed or or killed, not in the United States, at least Uh, in other third world countries. Yeah, they're being beheaded for their faith. A seed is in prison right now and they just transferred him over to to a worse prison. So they're assuming that he's being um, abused very badly where he is at because of his faith. But here in America, we don't understand what Peter is really saying to these believers at that time because we're not suffering like them. Now, well, then how can we relate and and how can we apply the instruction that Peter is giving to us? Well, what kind of suffering do we go through? Well, I know that in the United States right now, there is a great economic suffering. And so financially, uh, we're suffering, many of us. And, And really, if we if we examine our own finances, maybe not as bad as we think. We not, might not be able to go out and eat at Steer and Stein, you know, once a week. And, and we think, well, boy, that stops. So I'm, I'm suffering because I can't eat at Steer and Stein this week. You know, well, that's not suffering. I'm talking about not being able to pay your bills that you're always lacking and you're always in the negative, you know, and it's really hurting and you're really cutting back and you're trying everything possible to to make ends meet. And it's starting to hit you. And you're now concerned and now you're asking God, I need your help at this time. So there is an economic um, persecution, I guess, in a sense, you might say, maybe our own or maybe brought about by the economy in our in our country. What, what other types? Well, there's all other types, too. There could be abuse in families with children, with adults and relationships. So there's other types of sufferings that we may go through. In this world, uh, we may see more suffering going through because they're pushing their way to to um, persecute the believers. Uh, AB 1266 is, is one way. They pass this law that if you go to school and you want to go into the boys' uh, girls' locker room and you're a boy, then you can just say, hey, I feel like I'm a girl today. And so you get to go into the girls' locker room and take a shower with the girls. And that was going to happen on January 1st, 2014. But thank God, through a miracle, and we were talking to Jack Hibbs on Thursday, and I agreed with him because we had such a short time, and Governor Brown basically gave us a short time. He made it almost impossible for us uh, to raise the 500,000 signatures. He, He knew there was no way we could possibly do it. Well, they just counted it officially. He didn't know, Jack didn't know Thursday, but then they just counted, counted them officially and they got 600,000 signatures in time. So that means that law now has stopped. That won't happen in January until it comes to a vote. So this is where we stand up. Uh, you all were a part of that here in this church and many other churches. And uh, Jack was spearheading that. He's one of the... the persons is on the lawsuit towards the state of California because of that. And, and boy, is he zealous for things like that. I, I must have got about 15 emails from him concerning AB 1266. And they were all, you need to sign this petition. You need to sign this petition. And then they were calling me. And if I went, one time I said, all right, I've already gotten 10 calls from you, okay? You can take me off your list. We got it. <laughs> you know? I mean, because that's how serious they were about it. And it was a good thing because we got 600,000 signatures just in time. But there's a type of persecution that's coming along. Of course, preaching from the pulpit one day uh, uh, against homosexuality or maybe some of these other vices that are out there will become a hate crime. They consider it a hate crime already in, in 
Other nations like Canada, you can get put in jail if you preach from the pulpit that way. I'm still working with that. I'm not quite sure how I want to present that. I, you may hear me say, the Bible says, God says in his word that homosexuality is wrong. And I might be very clear to let you know that I'm not saying that. It's not my opinion. And it's not my choice and, and my decision to say that it's wrong. I'm letting you know that it's what the Bible says. And it's what God says. And by the way, I agree with it. So being very clear, not just coming off as though <clears throat> I'm giving you my opinion or my decision on what's right or wrong, because I'm not. God's the ultimate one to give us what, what is right and what is wrong. So he's going to give us some instructions on how to survive in these last days. So let's go ahead and read 13 through, through 16. Therefore, gird up your loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace of that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance. I, I would highlight that. I really would. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust. That should be highlighted in your Bible as a warning to us. As in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy... You also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. So what is he saying here? Let's look back at verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Let's stop there for a second. Therefore. So, of course, you all know that when you see a therefore or sometimes your Bible might say wherefore or it might say for or in light of or as and so forth. It, it, it's what it's saying is looking at the previous verses. Now that you understand this great salvation worth more than all the gold in the world was paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. It was all done for you out of love. And all you had to do was have faith and, and, and grace was given to you. Uh, the salvation that is worth more than anything that you could ever have. And it's yours and you've received it and you're. Born again, you have a living hope, and he's just expounding all what God has done for us. He says, now, because of that, therefore now, gird up your loins of your mind, of your mind. What does he mean there? To gird up your loins, uh, it was usually the custom back then. They, they wore some sort of tunic, some sort of robe, and it went all the way down to their to their feet. And they would basically live that way. And we have our... You know, men have their pants and their shirts, and this is how we, we live in California, shorts and a shirt, you know. Uh, this is how we dress. That back then, they dressed with a long dress for various reasons. Well, when they would have to do something quickly or get to work and, and get on their knees or bend over and things like this, they would take their loins and they would tie it and pull it up in between their legs. I wanted to get one of Virginia's skirts and kind of do that, but I didn't want to wear it up here. That would have been too funny. Uh, but basically, take it, put it on your legs, bring it up to the front, and then tuck it in. So that you made little shorts out of them, and then you could run and do what it is that you needed to do. So basically, you tuck it in your belt, and you were ready to do something. In 1 Kings 18.46, we see Elijah, who was being chased by Ahab. And it talks about him girding up his loins and running for his dear life. It's here, though, it's relating to the mind. Notice that gird up, gird up your loins of the mind. So why does he use the word mind there? Peter is saying, ready the mind, ready the mind, ready it for what? Just like the NIV says, therefore, prepare your mind for action. If you have an NIV for action, what kind of action are you talking about? The Roman soldiers, when they would... Uh, Get ready for battle, they would oftentimes get their loins and they would gird them up and then they would be able to fight in a fight very seriously and very quickly and very actively in that battle. So Peter is telling us that we must be prepared and committed for spiritual battle. He's not talking about us literally girding up our loins. He's talking spiritually about the mind. And we have to prepare our minds for the spiritual battle that is about to take place or is taking place in this instance. Sometimes we use the phrase rolling up your sleeves, right? You understand that one, like roll up your sleeves, 
what are you going to do? I'm going to get to work. No more playing around. Let's get to work. The middle voice indicates the action performed. This, this girding up your loins, this action that is performed is not for the benefit of others. It's for, it's for the benefit of you. You're not benefiting other people by you girding up your, your loins to serve. You're benefiting yourself by girding up your loins of your mind. And so it's for your benefit. It's for your good. It will prosper you. And who doesn't want to prosper? Who doesn't want to succeed? Who doesn't want to be blessed by the Lord? Well, I don't. That's not true. I think we all do. We all want to be blessed. And so in a sense, it benefits us. Because we gird up ourselves, our own loins of our minds. So the mind ought to be free from any hindrance. For example, like fear, worry. Those type of things that would hinder us from serving the Lord. Those are all mind things. And you can probably think of a lot more that the mind... Your mind is a terrible thing. It can depress you. It can convince you of things when things aren't really happening. It can make you think crazy stuff. We talk more to ourselves through our minds than we talk with other people. You are constantly talking to yourself in your mind. You're constantly worried in your mind. You can go to the store and go around the corner and you're thinking, what's going to happen to me if I go around that corner too fast? You know, it's going 100 miles an hour in your mind. It's amazing what your mind can do and say. And I think that's why Paul later on in Philippians tells us, tells us to meditate upon these things which are good. And it's a matter of exercising the mind. Exercising the mind in the Lord. See, they were preoccupied with their suffering. They weren't on track with their minds with the Lord. They were more concerned with what's going to happen to us next. And how are they going to kill us? Are they going to take our children? Are they going to behead us in front of everybody? I mean, their minds are just going crazy. And a lot of it may have come true. But they were so preoccupied with all of that that they were neglecting the Lord and the service of the Lord. They were neglecting the witnessing of the Lord. They were neglecting the example they were to be like the Lord. They were neglecting being like God. In fact, a lot of them were turning back to the former lust just so they wouldn't be persecuted or they wouldn't suffer. We see that today happens very often, that people turn back to the world because they're not getting what they want. They're not receiving what they think they should receive out of Christianity. So in a sense, Peter's saying, change your way of thinking concerning your situation. Change your way of thinking. Well, my way is just fine. I think just wonderfully. Then wonderful. How are you serving the Lord? How are you being a witness? Are you doing those things that Christ would be doing? Then if not, then change your way of thinking. You have to stop thinking the way that you are. Pull your thoughts together in a sense. Roll up your sleeves and get busy is what Peter is saying here. How many are ready to roll up their sleeves and get busy? How many of you are ready? I'm ready. I've been ready for a long time. I'm raising my hand. None of you want to raise your hand. But don't raise it if you don't mean it. Because I don't want you to be accountable to God. But how many of you are ready to serve the Lord? You know, I want to get busy. I want to see the Lord do some great things here. And I think he's going to do those things. And that's why we're setting things in place. That's why we're hoping that, that people will have this sense of, I'm ready and I want to do something and get involved and watch God begin to do the work that he wants to do here in Mariloma because it's about time. It's about time and I think the timing is right. I think the, the man is right. I think the place is right. And I think God is ready to move. What is the mind? The mind. There's a Greek word called deonoia. It's to a gate in mind in turn from separation, no eo, to think over. So it means thinking through something, meditating, reflecting. It refers to the intellect, the moral understanding, or the way of thinking. So it encompasses everything that the mind is capable of doing. From the past to the present, even to the future. And what the mind is able to do. It is the... Faculty of thinking, comprehending, and even reasoning. 
It's the seat of perception and thinking, the faculty of understanding, feeling, and even desiring. The mind is an amazing thing. And we need to gird up our minds. We need to work on our minds. We need to prepare our minds. And that is a battle in itself. And a battle we can't win without the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to gird up our minds. To know what to cast away. To know what to rebuke in the name of Jesus. To know what is true or to, to know what is not true. There's something that I like about the law. <clears throat> I like the law because the law in a sense is cold. Right? It's cold. It has no feelings. No emotions. You either kept it or you did not keep it. You're guilty or you're not guilty. It's pretty cold, so you don't have that emotional feelings. Now, we're not to be cold. We're to be loving and caring for people because people are like us, similar to us. And we were like them at one time, and so we have to have some love and some care for them. But in in a sense that we need to know what truth is so that we are not taken by our minds captive in a direction that God doesn't want us to go. Because then it will take us on, you know, rabbit hunts all over the place and we don't know where we're going to end up. So we have to stick with what we do know, what we do understand and what we don't, what we don't understand, what we what we don't know to be true or not true. We need to just leave those things alone and let God take care of them and just go forward with what God is calling us to do. I don't know if that makes sense to you. If you don't know a situation, then why are you involved in that situation? Just leave that situation alone and move on with the Lord. Because you could get into a rabbit hole and who knows where you'll be at down the road. This is a word that is chosen in the Gospels where Jesus states the first and greatest commandment of the law. To love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And that's the ultimate goal. Is with your mind, you gird it up. Just love the Lord with your mind. That means that we are to take our mind and meditate upon the Lord. Psalms 1. Meditate upon the law of the Lord. You know, regurgitate it. Think about it day and night. You know, constantly thinking of the Lord. Putting on that music. Listening to K-Wave. Whatever other means that you can occupy your mind with those things. All of that to say this. Do not let anything stop you from serving the Lord, even your mind. Then he says, be sober. Not just gird up your loins of your mind, but also be sober. Well, what is he talking about there? Alcohol? Not necessarily. The Greek word here means to be calm and collective in spirit. To be temperate and dis... Here's the word. Dispassionate. Dispassionate. Not passionate. Dispassionate. That's easier for men than it is for women. Women are very passionate, very emotional. That's how God made them. I believe that God made them that way because they want to cling to something. And so they know how to cling to the Lord and they know how to cling to their husbands. Because they are passionate and they're loving and they're touchy and they're feeling. Here, though, this word sober means dispassionate. Dispassionate, not necessarily in the relationship of a woman and a man or God, but in the sense that that there's a battle going on. You've girded up your loins. Now be dispassionate with the things that are going on around you and get busy with what God has planned for you. That word dispassionate means free from or unaffected by passion, devoid of personal feelings or biases, impartial, calm and dispassionate critic you just have to let it go and stop focusing on it and be sober or circumspective in your thinking the idea is to make sure you keep all your faculties fully operational now now what do I mean by that well your mind and your body everything is fully occupied operational towards the things of God. If you have a vehicle and you don't maintain your vehicle and you have one low tire because you're too lazy to put air in that tire, then your car is doing this, right? And then you don't put oil and so your engine light is on saying, give me some oil. 
And then, and, and then you, you haven't changed your windshield wipers because it's still summer and, and winter's not coming. But then all of a sudden rain comes and you notice your windshield wipers scraping and scratching the, the, the windshield, you know, because you don't want to change your windshield wipers. You don't have the money to do so, you know. And then your seat covers on your seat are torn and ripped and so you're sitting on springs. Now, now that is not fully operational, right? I mean, there's some there's some problems there. And so when you really need that vehicle, you you know, someone comes over and says, well, let's take your car. And you're going, oh, oh um, <clears throat> can we take your car? Well, why? What's wrong with your car? Uh, <clears throat> it's got a flat tire. The windshield wipers don't work. And the seats have springs are coming up all over the place and engine lights on. OK, I'll take my car. See how they feel. So in a sense, what he's saying here is that we need to be sober so that we're fully operational. And we have to have our minds, our bodies, everything ready for the Lord and what he has for us. In other words, have a well-balanced life. Be self-controlled. Peter uses the word again in 5, 8, where he says, be sober, be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Notice it says someone. That someone could be you. And if you're not sober, if you're not fully operational, if your mind is preoccupied with things it shouldn't be preoccupied with, then the devil's got you. He's devouring you. You're pretty much useless. You are being devoured. And that's someone. He likes someone. He starts with individuals. And then he works through those means. Don't waste your time on other things. Be ready. Be sober. Uh, Peter may be saying, uh, adopt a serious attitude, right? Because when you're drinking, and we associate soberness with drink, when you're drinking, you're not serious. You're partying. Give me a drink. Give me some alcohol. I want to have a good time. I want to just let loose. I don't want to be in, in, in full operational mode. I want to just let things hang out, you know, type of attitude. And so I don't have a care in the world. Let me just enjoy myself. But in a sense, he's saying, no, be sober-minded, And so be serious about it. I think that's something that's lacked in the church is seriousness. We come to church and we're really not serious about Bible study. We're not serious about the work of God there. We're not serious about. So we do everything. What half heartedly? I'm in a Bible study and I'm involved in that Bible study. But there's work to be done. You have to go through the book. You have to answer the questions and. Well, you know what? I'll wait till we go get to the Bible study and I'll do it then, you know, because I'm just too busy. I don't have enough time. But yet we'll watch a TV program that's on for two hours. We'll go to the movies. We'll go out to dinner. You know, we'll sleep in late. And there's always time. I really believe that there's plenty of time. I just don't think that we're serious yet here in the United States, in the Christian church. And we need to get serious. Um, how do we get serious? How do we get sober? Well, don't drink, for one, obviously. You don't want to be an alcoholic. You don't want to drink. You don't want to be intoxicated with something that's going to jeopardize your witness. So I would say cut alcohol completely out. Uh, Don't read material that's worldly, that's going to change your mind, that's going to affect the way you think and perceive things, because those things do. They affect the way you think when you're reading uh, magazines that you shouldn't be reading. It was was a blessing. There was a 70... Something year old lady here a couple of weeks ago had came up to me. She said, I need to share this with you. So I grew up in a church. And um, since I've been coming here to your church, I've been reading the Bible. And I understand it. Not only do I understand it, I want to read more of it. And the things I used to read. And I used to read these books, and she goes, I got piles of them, and I read them and read them and read them, and they're, they're these romance things that ladies read. She goes, I don't want to read them anymore. I feel weird when I read them, and so I want to get rid of them all. And so I started to give them away to friends, and then I thought to myself, what are you doing? Burn them. Throw them away. Don't give them away to someone else to read. And I thought, wow, Lord, your spirit is moving in her life. That's how the spirit moves in a life. They realize their minds become open. They become sober. And all of a sudden they understand truth. They stop doing those things that they know are harmful to their minds and to their lives. And fourth, stop wasting time. Stop wasting time doing nothing. 
Take your faith seriously. That's, that's the challenge today. Take your faith seriously. Get involved and get busy. Now, the next statement he says, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what is he saying there? Again, back to the grace again, what God has done for us. And says, so gird up your loins with your, of your minds, you know, be sober, but really rest everything on the grace of God. He's got you. You're secure. He has a future and a hope for you. And at his revelation, and that's future tense there, at his revelation, that is when he comes back for you, then it will all be fulfilled, this great salvation of ours. Remember three tenses, right? You were saved in the past, you are being saved, and one day we will be saved when we get to heaven. And so at Jesus' appearing, we will finally be there. So while we're waiting for salvation to come, be ready in mind and be sober to serve. Because there's a lot of needs in our church. As I said, we need parking lot attendants. We need ushers at different services so that we can rotate the other guys because they're getting tired. You know, uh, they need to sit down too and hear the word and get fed. And we need in the children's ministry. You know, my wife's here today and I've seen her now the last couple of weeks. But it's been years since I've seen her being able to sit in here and get fed this way even on wednesday night she's always in there serving and so we need people to help with the children's ministry and there's other ministries that will take time but we need a couple's ministry we need a men's ministry you know there are all kinds of ministries that are needed the only way for them to get fulfilled is when men decide to step up and take christianity seriously their faith let's move on to verse 14 as obedient children, not conforming or molding yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance. The word ignorance is speaking of spiritual ignorance, not necessarily worldly ignorance or wisdom, but it's spiritual ignorance. At one time, we were all ignorant spiritually. I didn't, I didn't know what salvation meant. I didn't know what it meant to be born again. I had no idea before I came to the Lord. I heard Jesus die on the cross for us and that we would go to heaven because we believe that. And I believe that I was going to heaven because he died on the cross. That was it. But as far as all the particulars of salvation and how it works and what I need to do and how my life needs to change, I had no idea. I was totally ignorant of all that stuff. And so I lived ignorantly. I enjoyed life. I partied. I took drugs. I drank. And I enjoyed life. I did things I shouldn't have been doing. I stole. I cheated. I lied. I did all these things that, that the world does today. And it's normal because it's done out of ignorance. And what Peter's saying here is now your children who obey because you've been born again as obedient children. It's not suggesting obedience. It's suggesting that you're already obedient. And so continue on in being obedient to the Lord. Don't look back at the world where you came from and begin to do those things that you did before. Get out of that situation. Otherwise, you're going to hurt yourself. In other words, what he's saying here is divorce yourself from your former lust. Divorce. That's a serious word, divorce. God hates divorce, but in this case, he loves it when we divorce ourselves from the world. Uh, divorce implies what? And when you think about it, huh? Separate. separate. But when you're separating, isn't there a lot of animosity? <laughs> there are a lot of trials and testings. Uh, don't you begin to hate the other person because of what's going on in the situation? And it's a challenge when you're going through a divorce uh, in real life. But when we divorce the world, that should be the heart we should have animosity against the world we should hate the world we should not want to be a part of the world we don't want them in our lives we don't want them around we don't want to see them we don't want to smell them we don't want to think about them you know that's divorcing the world isn't it that's how god wants our hearts to be from the world separate from the world from the former lives in other words break up with the lifestyle of this world break up with it <laughs> shouldn't be holding hands it was Spurgeon who wrote that faith and obedience are bound up in the simple in the same bundle. He that obeys God trusts God, and he that trusts God obeys God. And so as children, obey the Lord. Now here's some instruction. Get out of the world. Stop living along with the world. Live for Christ. Live for his church. Live for his work. 
But don't live in this world. Separate yourself from that world. A lot of people haven't gotten that yet. A lot of people are still living in the world and going to church on Sunday morning thinking they're okay. No, we're to totally separate, consecrate ourselves from this world. So it makes no sense to call yourself a Christian but not live like Christ. Returning to the former lust of this old life which is dangerous. Then he says in verse 15, and we'll we'll end on this verse, but as he who called you is holy. Now who's that? God. He called you and God is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct. Now the word be in the Greek means becoming. So he's not asking you to all of a sudden start doing something. He's telling you that you're already doing it. So continually be holy before the Lord. Set yourself apart. The word holiness means separate, apartness. Apart from what? The world. In all your what? Conduct. So Peter is pointing to the perfect pattern, who is God, who is perfect, who is holy. Peter's not using the word like, though, in the instance, in this instance here to introduce a comparison of equals. He's telling us the divine standard is God, his holiness. So we should be holy like he is holy. Get this. Nor is Peter giving us a moral law to follow. This is where we get confused, guys. Because when you think of the word holy, you're thinking, oh, okay, so what law do I have to follow? What do I have to do to show that I'm holy? You know, what do I have to abstain from uh, so that you know that I'm holy? You know, do I have a, a robe and have a halo over my head and a, a flat around my on my forehead like the religious leaders, you know, I come dressed a certain way. You know, they used to say some Pentecostal churches are holy rollers because they dress a certain way. You just say, oh, they're going in there to be holy rollers. See, he's not giving a moral law here to follow. The main idea behind this holiness is not a moral purity. Well, then what are you talking about? We're not to follow a law, some moral purity. He's talking about separating yourself from the world. <coughs> That is what holiness is about. Separating yourself from the world and separating yourself to God. Having that relationship. See, God is the model of holiness. He is separate from the world, so we should be separate from the world. He is holy in that the world is not in Him, so the world should not be in us. He's not giving us ten commandments to follow. He's saying, just separate yourself unto me. And you will become holy. Don't we tend to be like the person we hang around with? Isn't that true? You hang around a person long enough, you become like that person. If you have friends that that like to go out and party, you'll be challenged to go out and party with them. And eventually you will give in or you'll lose those friends. If you have a friend that, that loves a certain sport and you really don't care either way, eventually you will love that sport too. Because you're hanging around that person. So the people that we hang around with, it's very important that we choose good people. People that love the Lord, that are separate from the world, that won't drag us down. That will be like-minded in that they have a purpose and that is to serve God. If you really want to grow, hang around a person that is more mature than you are. And you'll grow that way. But you hang around a person that's not And you'll end up falling away from the Lord. So the more we hang around God, who is holy, will give us a sense of our need for holiness. Try hanging around God for a while. It's pretty amazing how all of a sudden he lets you know where you're right and where you're wrong and what you need to do. If we're to be like him, we must be holy as he is holy. Now let me talk a little bit more on this. Look at verse 16. Because it is written, be holy for I am. Am holy, and the word I is an emphatic use. It's intensive. What Peter is saying there is be holy because God said in Leviticus chapter 11, He said, Be holy for I am holy. I mean, it's, it's very forceful. I am holy. There is no evil, there is no darkness in me whatsoever. It's nothing but light. And so, because I am holy, I want you to be holy. Holiness for believers means this. Loving what God loves and hating what God hates. Being mature. 
F.F. Bruce said this, Christian holiness is not a matter of painstaking conformity to an individual's precept of an eternal or external law code. It is rather a question of the Holy Spirit producing his fruit in his life, reproducing those graces which were seen in perfection in the life of Christ. It's being like Christ. Being holy, being mature, not giving you a set of laws. What it is saying is when you start walking like Christ, in the same pattern of Christ, then you are holy as he is holy. So don't look at it as, okay, here's some purity law and I have to follow it. That's why I, you know, I understand some of these concepts you know, of <clears throat> promise keepers. You, know, you make some promises and you've got to keep them and so forth. I, I understand the concept. I don't necessarily agree with it 100%. Because I think that if we just follow Christ and love Christ, we'll keep those promises automatically. Same with the promise. I guess there's a promise ring, you know, that you give to girls and then now purity ring for girls and purity ring for, for guys. I understand the whole concept behind that. But if you teach your children to love God, <clears throat> there's no need for a purity ring. There's no need for a purity ring for your son because they'll know that's not something God approves of. That's not what I approve of. And they won't walk that way. If they have that relationship with God. I'm not saying that those things are wrong and you shouldn't do them. Not at all. But it's the deeper your relationship with God is, the more you're like God. So it's who you're hanging around with. So let's close. There was a time when our self-will shaped our lives. But no longer. Our lives are not our own. We need to gird up our minds. We need to be sober. We need to be ready we need to mold ourselves not according to the former lust of this world, but we are to be mature and Christ-like. Be holy as He is holy. Holiness is not so much something we possess as it is something that possesses us. God possesses us. Let's pray.